So let's come to today's uh, webinar that is empathy in product development. Lead with your ears and not with your mouth. So about the executive speaker, Paul. Paul uh, is kind of a pariah for early startups. And uh, he has a breadth of experience ranging from starting his own company to running products for a disruptive Bay Area startup, leading operations, engineering, etc. He has his uh, uh, hands well tried on AI, ML, uh, new age technology, uh, etc. And so without much ado, I hand over the session to Paul. And uh, Paul, we are very happy to have you with us. We are very honored to host you today. You can please take over the session and Paul can be reached on LinkedIn. Hi everyone, thank you very much for inviting me. It's, I would love to see everyone's face, to be honest. It's, um, it's, it's a little bit weird for me here to be here in Montreal, um, talking to a lot of you uh, without really seeing face contact. I'm, I'm very much into that, but uh, we'll try to do this um, the best way possible. <clears throat> so I'm very uh, thankful for the Institute of uh, Product um, Management, who basically invited me for uh, this lecture today. And um, the, the session itself is mainly about one of the biggest challenges I find most product managers and product leaders face, which is how do you convince other people to do what you want them to do uh, without uh, becoming uh, a wrecking ball and creating big issues and playing politics? One of the biggest issues in product management is really the politics one has to do because you're constantly dealing with people who are above you in the C-suite, who know exactly how to get what they want and oftentimes will prevent you from moving the product in the right direction. <clears throat> so today's lecture is really about uh, empathy, how to use empathy as a product manager to be able to lead your engineering team, lead your C-suite executive team, with your ears instead of your mouth. Um, as product managers, we're often asked to um, be good leaders, but it's, it's tough to be leaders when we don't have a seat at the table, we don't have the influence that comes uh, with the role. Oftentimes, you know, your role is product manager and you have to deal with VPs and SVPs and, and CEOs. So how do you basically uh, use your ears? I prepared this lecture for Product Camp Silicon Valley and also presented it in Agile Denver. And today I'm gonna uh, go over it with you. Uh, just a quick words about me. Uh, I'm a problem solver by nature. I've always been a problem solver. I, I seem to be able to jump into any startup or any small and medium company and uh, be able to take on the role of product management. Ultimately, product management is a problem solving role. You're trying to solve both a customer problem as well as a business problem. Uh, fundamentally, the business problem is the most important one to solve, but you can't do it without uh, having happy customers. And, uh, and you also need to maintain happy uh, working relationships with the engineering team, with the marketing team, as well as with other people who have an influence in your uh, environment. If you're in a B2B environment, the sales team is one of the, the key uh, team you want to have a happy relationship with. Um, my company, Bain Public, pretty much uh, parachutes into startups and companies who are in need of product management or organizational help. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do roadmaps. So I basically work with, with them in establishing the correct product management organization, help them define roadmaps, allow the product managers to up their sell through and, and keep the company focused on building great products. The reason it's called Bain Public, which in, um, in French stands for public bath, is because I often find that roadmaps are uh, just all about grooming and hygiene and keeping things clear and re removing the grease and removing all the, the fat and, and the bad stuff. So uh, in some ways, you know, just as, uh, just as we go to the, to the bath constantly to basically clean ourselves, you know, as a product manager, you're constantly grooming a roadmap, you're constantly washing it, cleaning it, removing the dirt. And ultimately, as you're going through the process of you know, preventing bad features or esoteric features from, from coming in, uh, you're also uh, in the process of trying to uh, keep your relationships with your coworkers uh, to be a positive one. 
So the biggest challenge I felt um, while I was running product for a Bay Area startup or when I was basically uh, playing the role of product management in bigger organizations is that the challenges of product development are really about interpersonal relationships. It, it ultimately comes down to how you basically work with the people around you and the empathetic component is what makes the product manager special. You know, it's, it's funny because we work in a field that values objective performance. Everything's about OKRs. We have to set objectives and key results. And, uh, or we need to pump out a very large amount of features and we need to you know, meet deadlines and everything's uh, quantified and everything's uh, performance driven. And in some ways, spending your time on empathetic interactions is perceived as a waste of time because it's not measurable. Why would you take the time to have a chat with someone over coffee? Why would you go out of your way to have a beer with someone after work? And why are you taking so long talking to your coworkers about what they did last weekend or their travel plans, whereas you should be focusing on uh, work, which is roadmap, features, customers, right? But there's a connection between empathy and other outcomes, such as enhanced team buy-in, smoother communication and information exchange. So empathy is the key uh, to building great products. And uh, today what we're gonna cover is how to give it to your office community and how to make sure that through it, people love you. Um, organizations, well, I mean, I've, I've, I've noticed this as I go from one organization to the other, that they don't want product managers to align product or the technology with the business strategy. Instead, they want those decisions to be done by the executives themselves. So such as sales, such as marketing, oftentimes the CEO doesn't want to let go. So as a product manager, you are asked to plan timing, you are asked to align resources, and you are asked to direct the engineering team to execute. Well, I don't call that product management. I call that project management. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with project management. Uh, the, the problem with uh, becoming a product manager who is doing a project management manager function is what we call in the States or in Canada as being a shit umbrella. I just wanna know, does everybody know what a shit umbrella is? And I don't know if I can hear anyone's feedback here, but uh, uh, you can leave, them, leave a comment. But the definition of a shit umbrella, um, and you'll hear a lot of people say, say that, is that you're being told what to do and people are pretty much uh, constantly telling you what to do. And it's easy as a product manager to constantly get lost with a list of innumerable things people are asking from you. And in some ways you feel like you need a big umbrella to basically protect you and the engineering team from all the requests that are coming from, from all angles. And your job isn't really to do everything they tell you to do. Your job is really to be able to influence them, so to prevent the, this, this innumerable ask of things. So how does one ensure leaders are making good decisions? Well, one way to look at it is to do exactly what I did when I started product management and I was in my early days in the 2010, 2011 timeframe which is just basically just tell people what to do. Um, so uh, this sketch pretty much illustrates how not to go about doing things, yelling at people and telling them what to do isn't gonna move you any forward. And especially if you adopt that attitude with, uh, with, with the C-suite, you're quickly going to uh, be asked to leave your functions. Uh, a quick story about me, my first job as a product manager, I jumped in thinking that I was the CEO of the product. And I quickly decided to adopt this type of approach with the engineering team, um, the, the sales team, as well as the, the CTO of the organization, uh, as well as the CEO. And, you know, maybe I wasn't as aggressive as this picture illustrates it, but I was pretty much, you know, telling people what to do and telling them, hey, which part is it that you don't understand? We need to work on the API. Well, guess what? Within eight months, I was fired. It's never fun to be fired, especially if you're a good product manager, if you listen to customers, if, if you basically communicated requirements to engineering and really started adding beautiful features to, to the product that 
basically showed traction and KPIs were basically being met. So why would you get fired? Because nobody wants to work with you. If everyone in the organization is constantly not happy with the conversations they have with you because every conversation is an argument, then soon enough you're going to be uh, pointed as being the guy who doesn't, doesn't work well with other people. And that's for a product manager, you're out. Uh, the average time frame for a product manager in a company is about a year to a year and a half. That's because it's easier to replace a product manager than the entire engineering team or whoever else was complaining about you. So in some ways, because we have no authority, we really have to find alternate ways to basically make sure that things um, are moving in the direction we want to move them at. Um, so you're gonna have to work with a lot of people who want different things and everyone has an idea after all. So when it comes down to prioritization, you're often asked you're given three or four initiatives that are going to be part of a roadmap and you want those ideas to go head to head and idea number one gets crushed by a hippo uh, a hippo what is a hippo a hippo stands for the highest person paid person in the organization so you just imagine you're in a meeting room and everyone's in the meeting room making a decision and the highest paid person in the organization aka the ceo the CTO, the CPO, whoever you want, comes into the room and crushes your idea. Despite the fact that you have all the, all the, the business background and the customer data showing that this feature needs to be added, um, oftentimes uh, they get crushed. Idea number two gets diluted beyond recognition. Oftentimes a lot of people would love the ideas and the features are basically going to get uh, spread through in a way that you know, un unfortunately, the dilution is just going to make the idea invalid. And number, number three, idea number three is going to get killed outright, even though it's a good one. The CEO just doesn't like it or something like that. So what happens usually is that idea number four is the one the company goes forward with. Oh, yeah, let's go with that one because we didn't crush that one or dilute it or kill it outright. Unfortunately, idea number four is the wrong prioritization. As a company, as, as a product manager, your job is to make sure that the right idea moves forward, which is idea number one. So how do you go about making sure that it doesn't get crushed by the hippo? Um, so in 33% of organizations, the strategy decision making happens without product management. That's, those figures come from multiple studies that were conducted. That means that, uh, that, means that about 63% of, of organizations are actually making it with product managers. But what happens if you jump into an organization um, um, where these decisions aren't being made? So given how many people are involved in an organization with emotions, egos, unique styles, and different, the human element of any business makes building things very, very hard. You've got to be aware of people's emotions, egos, styles, goals. At times, that requires a lot of diplomacy. So we have no power to make other people see things the way we do. These are your constraints. This is the world within which you must work. So how do you go about creating consensus? You're not going to win every single battle. So the product manager's job is to run a decision-making process that ensures that all perspectives get heard. Leadership is going to be wrong sometimes. Engineers will estimate wrongly, and the sales team will always promise things your team doesn't and will never do. And because you're at that intersection, there will be very little shared understanding. Ultimately, the roadmap process is what's going to save you. Now, the, the value of a roadmap is not the roadmap itself. Now, it's great to build beautiful roadmaps. And I know a lot of people go out there on Google searching for roadmap templates and roadmaps tools. It's not really about the tool or the template. It's really about the process of roadmapping. It's about all the conversations and learning that happen along the way. We're humans, after all. And as humans, we want to be involved in decision making. And as a product manager, it is your duty in some ways to basically initiate a road mapping process and not the roadmap itself. And the process is one where you need to hear everyone's take on everything and make sure that they, you become the tiebreaker. You don't, you're not the person who makes the decisions, but you got to make sure that you, you 
you achieve consensus. So best idea, not consensus. This is a great sketch of what happens when you basically just allow everyone else to make a decision. Um, I don't know if you guys are reading this, but yeah, uh, if you let everyone else in a company make a decision on your behalf, that's considered teamwork, but that doesn't mean the best ideas are being heard or the best ideas are moving forward. Empathy is a facilitator for communicating what you're trying to achieve. And in some ways, what is empathy? Empathy is, 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 is a way of communicating where you personally are trying to put yourself in other people's shoes in order to make sure that their, their concerns are being heard and you're trying to turn them into uh, achieving the same goals that you're trying to make everyone achieve in an organization. First of all, you're not a shit umbrella. People need buy-in into a vision. The future needs to be created as a group uh, and through the process of road mapping and all the conversations and learning along the way, you try to turn yourself from being an order taker into a person who is playing a big part in the product process. So the bad way of going about um, initiating this process is letting people know that their point of view is the wrong one and that you're not interested in listening to them. So if you approach things, product management and road mapping from this angle, what's the point of looking at your side of the argument, then you're not gonna win a lot of battles, especially with people with a lot of influence. So then they'll tell you what to do. The good way to look into this is to ask people, can we swap glasses? It, it might help me see your point of view. Because great products are built by teams with a huge conviction for what matters to their customers and then who are prepared to move seamlessly together. The word together, well, if you're not understanding what your colleagues aren't liking about some of the suggestions that you're putting forward, whether or not they're correct or incorrect, it's really up to you to basically make sure that you understand their point of view. Ultimately, if they don't hear, that, they don't feel that you're heard, that they've been listened to, then they won't buy into your ideas and to your features. And no buy-in equals no delivery which ultimately means unsuccessful products. So how should we go about this? <clears throat> Take the stop to stop and chat. Stop and chat. It seems like in a computer world, we're constantly in front of monitors, we're constantly sending emails, we're on Snapchat, we're, we're on Facebook, we're on social media, we're tweeting, we're, we're always in front of a computer. The human element is what makes product managers special. Being able to go and chat with someone in front of, outside of a computer, over coffee, at the water cooler, in the kitchen, over lunch, uh, in the hallway, in the elevator, those are all great opportunities to chat. And as a product manager, <clears throat> I feel that in my everyday job, my most precious moments are those moments where I've taken the time to stop and chat. I built an envelope of trust by involving others in the solution finding process. So if I'm in a situation and I jump into a corridor and I suddenly see someone that I need to talk to, for example, the head of engineering, I will quickly approach them and talk a little bit about them, what's happening with their lives, and get, them, get their perspective on, you know, are, are, you, are you in agreement with some of the roadmap elements we've been talking about? How do you go about doing that? Well, once you take the, start, the time to stop and chat, you have to ask what and how questions to improve relations with people. What and how questions are the most important questions to ask as a product manager? Because the position of lack of authority, you're coming in and you're trying to tell someone, look, all I care for is to understand your perspective. I need to put myself in your shoes. I need to be you. I need to think like you so that I understand exactly why you're not aligned with what I'm saying. So asking questions like, what's wrong here? What's your story? Connect the dots for me. What information do you have? Are great conversation starters because you're not telling someone to tell you back and then information. You're not screaming at them. You're not telling them up front that you're in disagreement with them. You're giving them or empowering them to, to provide you with the information you need. So what happened from your point of view in that last meeting? I felt that you were a little bit angry. 
Or what do you expect from me as a product manager? You told me to do five things, but I also came to you with a bunch of data telling you, showing you that the customer ha is not re reacting positively to some features. What do you expect from me? What, what specific issues do you help, help with? And those basically get people talking about um, their perspective. That's the most important part. This is a formulaic approach. Once you ask a what question, you need to pause. You need to listen to the other person. Oftentimes we have this tendency to rewind what we want to say in our heads and we're not listening to the other person. We rewind and then we just ask the question differently. That's not the true case. You need to pause an extra second and get the other person to respond. If that person doesn't respond, stay silent. Make this awkward silence benefit you as a product manager. The longer the other person doesn't answer the question, the longer you need to stay silent. Because ultimately that person's gonna open up and tell you exactly what the problem is. And that's, that's where you as a product manager can move on to the next thing. As soon as that person goes out and tells you exactly what the issue is, you need to make sure that you repeat the last one to three words of what they just said and use exactly what they say. So I'll give you an example. The head of our, uh, or I'd say the VP of, um, uh, of sales at Watch Mojo came to me the other day and said, <clears throat> the conversation was pretty simple. I said, what is it about the new clients that uh, is giving you a hard time? And he said, well, <clears throat> so you notice that I started with a what question. And his answer was, <clears throat> Turns out that some of the customers want the content in HD. And my answer to that was, I just repeated the last one to three words. And I said, want the content in HD. By using exactly what they said, he continued elaborating further. So by repeating the last word he said, wanting the content in HD, he basically went out saying, yes, 1020p, that's the format that the customers are wanting for. Nine out of 10 customers of mine or prospects of mine are only asking for that file format. So we need to basically uh, you know, uh, change, change the software and the API to add uh, that type of format. At this point, it's my opportunity as a product manager to ask the how question. As a follow-up, I need to repeat what he said. So I say, so if I'm understanding, what you're saying is that nine out of 10 customers need files in 10, 20, 1080p format in HD. And if you were to basically offer that format, or if we were to offer that format, we would make more money. And then you collaborate. So repeating what someone said is an acknowledgement from you as a product manager that you heard that person, that you put yourself in their shoe and you're trying in your head to understand if you, and, and validate if you understood them correctly. So then you continue saying, okay, why is that? Why? Tell me more about that. Can you be more specific? So these are ways of just engaging in conversation in a way where you make the other person believe. And I'm stressing the word believe here. To be explicit, as a product manager, these conversational tools are just part of your arsenal. You might be naturally good at it, or you might not know how to conduct conversations with people of high authority and get information out of them. But appro approaching the what and how questions is a great way for you to start getting some highly powered people with a lot of influence in your organization to start talking about uh, some of their uh, problems, issues, areas that are bothering them and why they're not supporting you. By repeating what they're saying word by word, you're basically letting them know that you have taken the time to process what they told you and that you heard them. What this does is allows you to really move forward into the conversation and dig deeper to a point where you're gonna be able to influence this person. So look at that person and start saying things with emotion. So, when I was talking to the sales VP, I told him, you seem to be aggravated by this issue. Are you aware that we have never um, created uh, any of our content in 1080p, even though the customer wants it, the 
company isn't really ready to do this, but why are you so aggravated? And then he went out telling me how he's unhappy that the company has made a decision three years ago about not supporting this type of file format. And now the company's not ready for it. And he's going to lose a lot of sales because of it. And the problem isn't me as a product manager. The problem is really the C-suite in the organization that hasn't really been proactive about that. Okay, let's hammer a way forward. That's a great way to move the conversation from past tense, which is the language of blame. Notice that the VP of, of sales was asking, was complaining about a decision that was made by someone else three years ago. The, when people talk in the past, they talk the language of blame. The past is always about blame. It's about he did it, he should have done this. They did that wrong, that's his fault. Those are bad languages. You never want to have conversations in the past tense. You don't want to have conversations in the present tense because when you have conversations in the present tense, it's all about my values versus your values. I like it, you don't. And those are argumentative conversations. Well, I want it red and you want it blue. Tell me why you should be red or blue. We don't want to have those conversations. As product managers, we want to detach ourselves as far as, far as possible from arguments. So we want to have conversations in the future. The future is the language of choice. Choice is, not a, is the most empowering influencer that you have as a product manager. Because you, by switching a conversation to the future and giving someone a choice, you're empowering that person to tell you what they think should be done. At that point, you basically can uh, can, can make that person feel that you've taken the time not only to listen to them, that by switching the conversation to the future and asking them for their choice, they've, they've told you exactly how to proceed if it, the decision was left to them. That doesn't mean that the decision is made, but at that point, you basically have that person exactly where you want them because you've basically given them, the, the, they've opened up to you and they're vulnerable to you as a product manager who has basically manipulated the conversation to get to that choice. So by saying, okay, let's hammer a way forward, you basically turn the conversation to a choice and you become their friend, the guy who's going to help them basically find a solution. So now you ask a how question. So how can we prevent this from happening again? How should we proceed or how can we go and learn from this? So my question to the VP of sales was how can we fix this? It's not as easy as just adding another feature in the API and just asking people to put the 1080p parameter in the API. We still need to create those assets. We still need to have uh, the entire infrastructure and processes of the companies change in order to make this happen. So how can we grow and learn from this? Or I don't care about the mistake. How should we proceed? And, and, and now you have a friend. Now you have a person who's willing to work with you to find a solution. So let's figure a way forward. Let's figure a way for us to get along and move forward on this issue. So offering a choice oftentimes is the best way to basically create yourself a person who will support you in your decision-making process. But oftentimes when you offer a choice, you're basically making yourself vulnerable to receiving the answer you don't want to hear. So, if you offer a choice, that person answers, hey, we got option A, we got option B, which one should we take? And they go with option B, and that's not the option you want as a product manager, then you lose. You basically weren't able to influence this person. So the real secret is to offer a choice, but finish it with a, either way, we need to align with a collective goal. So when I went to the VP of sales, and I was like, look, we have a choice here. We can, can, we can change the company process and approach and start allowing people to start import uh, HD in 1080p format for this to move forward. Or we can shortchange the process and make people believe that we can, the 720s can be reformatted to 1080. Either way, we need to to provide a highest quality picture to the customer. And I don't think that option B is the right approach. So the either way, I'm gonna highlight the either way. The either way 
is, is, is how you as a product manager can offer a choice by restricted to what you want them to say. So I want, I do this with my daughter. I have two daughters and I'll, I'll basically say, you know, they want ice cream for breakfast, right? Who doesn't have kids who want ice, ice cream for breakfast? So I'll say, look, you have a choice. You can have your ice cream for breakfast or you can have it for supper. Either way, you're not going to have ice cream until you're done eating your morning breakfast. So in some ways, I basically told my child that it's okay for her to have ice cream. It's her choice. She can have it now or she can have it later. But either way, I'm not going to let her have it unless she eats the nutrients she needs to eat for breakfast. So how do you stop someone from eating ice cream in the morning and only ice cream? Well, you're going to offer them a choice. Yeah, ice cream, you can have it now or you can have it later. Either way, finish your breakfast and you might be able to have ice cream if you choose to. So it works with kids. It works with executives. It works with people with influence in an organization. You only have to find a way to basically give, provide that choice to people uh, and, and frame that choice in a way that aligns with a collective goal you're trying to achieve, a goal that's good for the organization. Sales might not be able to hit their quotas and their figures and their numbers if they don't have HD video as part of the product. But as a company, we can no longer afford to, 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 to basically shortchange the process and ship bad quality videos because that's not going to allow us to reach collective goals. So which one is it going to be? So give it a purpose. You have to tap other people's innate desire to serve. If those people are serving, they're going to they're gonna feel that your, your even way you need to do something right is going to get them to, to align with you. And that alignment is going to allow you to move together. So the future needs to be agreed as a group. So learn to influence, not direct. Never tell people what to do. Simply use this technique of what and how and, and basically moving the conversation to the future and offering a choice with an either way we need to do something the company needs to do. What this allows you to do is it gives you the earned social capital. Social capital is the most important thing you need as a product manager to success. Because if people perceive you socially as being a person who's not going to get into arguments, who's not going to be defensive, who's not going to tell people what to do, and they see you as a very nice person who is willing to cooperate, that social capital is going to get you pretty far. Because when you need a favor for someone, you turn back and you say, I'm so sorry, I would have this conversation, but this is a problem we need to fix, and I need this favor from you. And that person, let it be the CEO or anyone in the organization, is gonna realize that in the past, throughout roadmaps and features and product innovations, you have always cooperated and always behaved in a way where you've offered everyone a choice. And at one time, you need to use your social capital to be able to convince them they will listen to you, they will respect you, and they, you will get the, the, to move your ideas forward and move the product forward. Oftentimes, we're too busy thinking about ourselves and what we are saying in conversations. That stops now. I want to be explicit. To be a good product manager, you cannot listen to yourself in your head while other people are having conversations with you. You need to listen to them, you need to pay attention to cues, and you need to be the person who has two ears and one mouth. If you have two ears and one mouth, then you should listen twice as much as you speak. I tell my daughter, whenever she gets into fights with her friends at school, how many ears do you have and how many mouths? And she says, I have two ears. And I say, then why didn't you listen twice as much as you spoke? Because listening is, is what really gets you ahead. And it also helps you uh, think, you can't, you, you can't think ahead of what you're going to say next. So this technique is just one where you are basically listening to other people, repeating the last three words of the last sentence they said, explaining it, okay, if I understand you correctly, and then repeating exactly what they said, and then offering a choice really helps you, you know, remove your mind from that position of, I'm going to tell this person facts, I'm going to show him that I have a point. You're no longer that person. As a product manager, you're there to listen, and you're there to influence the outcome of the conversation so that it goes the way you want it to go. 
So give it attention to unspoken cues. When you're having conversations, look at people's eyes. What are those eyes telling you? Are they angry? Are they anxious? Are they against you? Are they reacting? Um, are they dull? Are they unhappy? Are they um, showing that they're indifferent to things? Go to social intelligence to this URL here and test yourself. There's a great test and it will allow you to see how much, how much social intelligence you have. Some people have it, some people don't. But if you're not looking at people's eyes when they're talking to you, you won't have an idea if they're in agreement with you or not. The biggest indicator that someone is with you or against you in a conversation is, is their body language. If you look at their body language, you'll quickly realize if they're indifferent or with you. If they're nodding their head with a big smile and their eyes are saying, yes, yes, I agree, then you know that they're with you. But if they're doing the opposite and still saying, yes, I agree, then your social intelligence should basically give you hints or a cue that this person is going to throw me a grenade at some point and I'm going to have a hard time dealing with him. So every team member has their own opinion and sometimes productive disagreement arises. So help them to get, your job is to help them guide to the best decisions for them. Your job isn't to basically be a lawyer and go and argument the worst why things should be done a certain way. This product management is not about getting a law degree. Product management is about guiding or helping guide people to make the best decisions for them. So embrace discourse. That means embrace the fact that people are going to be in disagreements, but you need to be the person who facilitates the conversations who helps people find a common ground. So you're in a meeting room, you're looking at people's eyes, your head of sales and your head of marketing and your head of engineering are at odds. They're arguing. Everyone has a different opinion. What's your job as a product manager? Your job is not to take sides. I agree with Jim. I agree with engineering. We need to resolve the technical debt instead of focusing on customers. That's not what they're expecting from you as a product manager. You need to be the facilitator. You need to fill the gaps between people. You're, you're the best, that's the best time for you as a product manager to step in and start asking what and how questions, repeating what people are saying, calming everyone down, change, switching the conversation to the future and moving forward with a choice. I'll give you a personal example. I'm in a meeting room with the CEO <clears throat> Um, as well as the CFO of an organization. They're at, they're, at, they're at both ends. They don't agree with one another. And, and they're disagreeing over the benefits of a product feature that is internal to the company that really has helped the company uh, decrease its costs. Optimization is, uh, is a value add for an organization. If you're basically decreasing the cost of building something, that increases margins in an organization. And oftentimes, we forget in product management that it's not about gaining new customer or getting customers to upselling them on new features. You really sometimes want to realize that if something that costs a lot for a company to build, you know, decreasing those costs also has benefits to the organization. And unfortunately, those are not things I can say to them because they're arguing. So I turned the conversation around and I said, okay, what is it? What's your point of view? Ask, and I asked the CEO directly that question. What is it that I don't understand about what you're saying? And he went and explained and I repeated the last three words. And I said, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that margins are more important to this organization than acquiring more customers. And I turned around to the CFO and I said, do you agree that margins are more important than new customers? And the CFO said, I do agree, but uh, I do have a different perspective on this. And he provided his perspective. And by basically embracing the discourse here, and I said, guys, we have a choice. We either increase margins or we increase the number of customers. Either way, this company needs to move forward and make a profit. And, and ultimately, new customers doesn't always mean profit because we're bleeding on the other end by the, our overall cost of, cost of goods sold. And you know, by offering a choice and giving them this option, they basically collectively decided that they're gonna move forward with the optimization. So ultimately, I, my role here was to become the, 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 the person who basically helped them build a good relationship. I was the person who helped them 
figure out a way forward without really imposing my thoughts in it. Let's talk a little bit about medicine and doctors. <clears throat> uh, doctors, um, just like children who play with one, one another, listen to the chest with a stethoscope. If you guys know, a stethoscope is something that doctors no longer use. There's different ways for people to go and grab a lot of information. Uh, but they still use it. And why do they do that? Well, turns out, that for to be a good listener as a physician, you need to basically ask people, use the same techniques, ask people the same questions and use the stethoscope to generate this impression that you've heard the customer, the client out. So when you go to the doctor, think a little bit of what happens. The first thing the doctor does is that he, will, he or she will ask you, well, what about what, what, what's going on with your life? Tell me a little bit more about your job. What are the stressors in your job? What about family life? How's your wife? Why do you think the doctor's asking what and how questions? They're not interested in you. They're not interested in your life. They're not interested in your wife. They're not interested in anything you say. They're only asking you what and how questions, repeating your answers to make sure that you feel that they've heard you. Next step, they will take a stethoscope and they will put it on your heart. There is nothing better to demonstrate to you that the doctor listened to you than seeing a stethoscope on your heart. Then they will ask you to open your mouth and cough. Then they will put a light in your ear to look inside your ear. All these are made to validate your health, but in some ways, they're actually there just to allow the, the doctor or the physician to build a connection, to forge a connection with you, for you as a, as a as an patient to feel that you are being listened to. After that, a doctor will ask you to provide, to go and do a blood test. The blood test is gonna give him all the data he needs to, to ask you to make a life-changing decision. So, <clears throat> A doctor, first of all, will ask you what and how questions. Second of all, will go with a stethoscope ceremony to, to touch you. That touch is going to create a bond. In the workplace, when you're in the workplace, don't worry, touch people. I know, and I'm not asking this in a, in a, in a sexual way. I'm talking about a therapeutic way. If you have an, a healing way, if you have people who are aggravated, anxious, unhappy, those are great opportunities to touch them, touch their hand, give them a hug. Uh, anything you can do to basically show your support to someone through touch will help you as a product manager empathize with them and they will know that you have good and their, their best interests at heart. So in some ways you want people to feel that you know how they, how they feel. This picture illustrates the best way of how people are um, if you are in the same position as the other person and they feel that you're understanding their pain, then, then they will be open to understanding you. So first, a physician will address the emotional and then they will move on to the informational aspect. So information aspect is going and doing a blood test. And then suddenly the blood test will give you all kinds of numbers about your blood, your cholesterol, your, your insulin levels and all kinds of other things. And once, once that um, bond has been created and the numbers are there, the doctor is gonna be able to ask you to make a life-changing decision. You need to exercise more. You need to, um, to, to go to the gym more. You need to stop smoking cigarettes. You need to eat healthy. A doctor, if he didn't go through the whole process of asking you what and how questions and the ceremony of the stethoscope, as well as the blood test, was never going to be able to make you change your, life, your, your, your lifestyle. But for them to change your lifestyle, they need to basically use these tools to get you to cooperate with them. So as a summary, you need to be just like this doctor. You need to be empathetic. As a patient, they need to feel that you're just like them and you feel their pain. You always need to build community in the workplace and your team is much stronger when people are connected. So first, address the emotional by asking people what and how questions. The most important thing, 
then move on to the informational aspect. Give, the, give them user and data after you've done the what and how ceremony. Then you offer them a choice with shared values. If you offer a choice, but tell them either way, we need to align with uh, the shared values of this organization, you're gonna be able to at least get them to choose the option that's best for the organization. And then you need to ask the last question. This is the influence question. This is what I need from you. Uh, as product managers, we often feel that it's tough for us to ask people to do something. How do you, can you tell a CEO what you need from them? But if you approach this from this one, two, three, four process, ask what and how questions, get the data, give them a choice with a sense of purpose and turn around and tell the CEO, this is what I need from you. I need you to make the decision that's going to make this product succeed and these numbers to go up and for our, for our collective shared values to get aligned. And they will make the right call. But you didn't do it in a confrontational way, you did it in a way that's more empathetic. And then your last question is, are we still aligned? Do you need anything from me? Showing to them that you as, a, as an empathetic person is aligned with them and wants to give them the opportunity to ask something out of you. So selling is not just for people in sales. I think you understand at this point explicitly that you as a product manager are in sales. You are selling your ideas to the rest of your organization. You have a lot of data. You need to make sure that people around you hear your data. You can shove it down their throats. Your goal is to basically empathetically make sure you hear everyone out and then able to address the issues at hand through this sympathetic approach. So just to leave this off, this is the last uh, slide. Take the time to stop and chat. You realize that by slowing down and by not being busy all the time and spending more time becoming this type of coach, mentor, person who's listening to others, your job as a product manager will be much, much, much easier. Um, thank you very much. This is pretty much it. We have 15 minutes for questions. What I really wanted to say is that I have an ebook on this subject. Just send me an email or connect with me on LinkedIn and ask for the ebook, and I'll send you all this information. You can connect with me at paul at bainpublic.com. Bainpublic.com is my website, and you can connect with me on Twitter. I will go for questions and answers at this point. So I will just read out the questions to you that I've collated uh, from the people across the LinkedIn and Facebook and uh, emails that have come into us. So yeah. can I read out the questions to you now? Sure. Yeah, I'm seeing them as well. Yes. Right. So uh, I'll probably read out the questions that came in from the email and then probably you can take up the ones that have come in the QA section as well. Okay. Let's do that. All right. Yeah. So uh, the first question is, how do I balance the tech team requirements and hard pressed demands while working in a product function. So the person's asking, this is coming from Anisha, and uh, what she asked specifically is when you represent the product team, a lot of times you have this constant argument or maybe you know uh, disconnect with the tech team because they are hard pressed for deadlines and you're hard pressed for customer satisfaction. Yeah. So how do you bridge that by, you know, by the use of empathy or by seeking alignment? Well, the first thing I do is like, you know, as you have your weekly meetings, what I don't like about Scrum or Agile or all these approaches is that they force you to have conversations about technicality. When you're with the engineering team, you're always talking about problems and tasks and bugs and issues. And I, I would enforce um, uh, having a human conversations, at least the first five to 10 minutes of any meeting you have about what people did over the weekend, their children, their family life, fun stuff, bad stuff. Uh, what's important is really realizing that, pe like, that you are human and the engineering team is human. And then bottom line, we all have families, we all have lives, we all have things and talking about them is fun. What that allows the, you to do is, is really create an atmosphere of, you know, for you, what's paramount as a product manager is the well-being of your colleagues rather than the issues that are happening at work. Um, that, once that connection has been created, it's easier to have conversations with people about 
okay, so what's bothering you about this? You, know, you are hard pressed, there are deadlines, I completely understand that, and there's customer issues. Let's talk about them. And then, and then I'll go into the what and how. Uh, what's really important is not to become a machine. Don't, don't be that product manager going into scrum meetings and having like this five minute uh, or 15 minute conversations about ticket number five and ticket number 17. If you do that, you're always gonna get busy and you're always gonna be in conflict. So take the time to ask people about their travels, their families, their concerns and their daily lives. And you'll quickly realize they'll treat you as a human and solutions will be found. Because when people perceive you as a human, the answer oftentimes is gonna be, I'll make it happen just for you because you're a nice person. And, and you know, it's funny how when, when people see you as a robot, how suddenly their time becomes such an important thing that they, they basically find constraints around it. Right, right. So you're saying that probably I don't just stick to scrum meetings and the five minute stand-ups, but probably spend a little more time discussing. Yeah, yeah. turn it into a 30 minute meeting and impose a 15 minute of just talking about families, weekends, conversations, activities, children, do it all, uh, dogs, animals, everything. It's right. humanity is the most important aspect. You bring in the human basically will go out of, out of their way for you uh, so we all have constraints you know they right. realize you're busy as well um, but you know just just by realizing that we're all human people are willing to accommodate more absolutely right so um, that, that makes sense uh, there's an additional question that's come up after this question came up so this is by Atul Kumar saying what if my stakeholders don't consider me as a good representation of my function Let's say I'm a young PM and my whole tech team is a bunch of uh, elder or older people. And they think, yeah. you know, I don't have the necessary years of experience or, you know, I've been probably lucky enough to have got, you know, uh, accidental PM. I just become PM by accident. So multiple reasons. And they don't think you probably understand what they're building. So what do you do in such situations? Well, <clears throat> Um, then you need to have four ears, not just two ears and one mouth, but four ears. That, right. that means you need to listen four times more. Because people aren't trusting you because they feel that your words are, don't mean anything because they don't come from experience. And their words are 10 times more important than your words because they have all the experience and, and the, the lifespan of the, of the product. So Absolutely. in some ways, being more attentive to them, what they're saying and hearing them out becomes more important for you. So. Right. You know, they'll, they'll, they won't understand why you're taking so much time listening to them, but they will appreciate it because they realize that you don't, you're not that junior kid with a big mouth telling them what to do, even though like, because if you do that, you, you, you're perceived as being cocky and people don't like cocky people, right? But right. they do like working with people who are taking the time to listen and understand. So even if you do understand it, just pretend that you have four ears and ask more questions and get their feedback. And sooner or later, they will start um, respecting you for having taken the time to understand where they're coming from. Makes sense, makes sense. Right, so um, for the following questions that have come on the QA section, uh, would you be taking each question or would you like for me to read them out to you? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll read them myself. Uh, so the first one, uh, I'm really bad with names. I'm working with a startup that yes. helps name. No Prashant Avlam. Prashant Avlam. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if empathy is a continuous process through the product management process, how do you measure empathy at each stage of the process? <laughs> uh, you will measure empathy by the amount of talking you did in a conversation versus the, time, the amount of listening. So at the end of the day, if you take the time to pause and you think about every conversation you had during the day, ask yourself, which one of those conversations did I do most of the talking and which one of those conversations did I do most of the listening? And if you find out that you're doing more talking than listening, then things need to change. Because I, I personally, every conversation I have, I ask myself that question. And if I realize that I did most of the talking, I, I hate myself. I really, um, I, 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 I'm hard on myself and I ask myself, why did I talk so much? Why am I such a big blabbermouth? Because that's the only way I can quantify if I'm doing my job right, is if I'm doing most of the listening. Uh, so ask yourself the question, then ask yourself the question, through my listening, was I able to go 
influence this person to do what I want them to do. Um, and if you're not able to get to that influence part because it takes a lot of confidence building it up, uh, do the listening and practice uh, influence with kids and have children, it's great. Because you know, you just need to, that confidence of being able to switch a conversation from what and hows into choices and offering them constraints in the choices to make sure that they make the right call. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think I think yeah. I probably wait for them to send in a second question if at all. But I think yeah, the kind of answers what to do with every step of the process. Okay. Uh, then he said, how can we ensure we build product based metrics, which has the right amount of empathy? Okay. So this goes back to the, to the physician. When a physician does the empathetic part and uses a stethoscope, the next step they're going to do is they're going to go and do the, the data part, which is asking for blood tests and scans and x-rays and everything. So that's where the metrics come in. Right. And then comes the choice conversation. The, the doctor, is gonna tell you, look, you need to basically, you have a choice. You either take a pill or you change your lifestyle. Either way, I'm your doctor and I'm going to be there and it's my duty to make sure that you get healthy. So what you, you, have, you have to use the data as basically a way for you to frame your choice. Uh, it's like, look, the data is showing that you need to change your lifestyle, but you have two options here. There's a pill option, and then there is a changing a lifestyle option. I'm here to help you make the right choice for you. Uh, so how do you ensure that? Do the empathetic part first, just like the doctor. Then go ask for blood test. Don't do it the opposite way. Don't start the conversation by showing them the data. Start the conversation by empathy, and then just out of the blue say, okay, let's go do a little test. I'll gather some data, and next time we come in here, we're basically going to look at the data, and together we're gonna to choose what's the right thing to do, just like a doctor does. And then once the data comes in, you get into a conversation with that person and say, look, I heard you out. I understand uh, every constraint you've had. The data shows the customer is not reacting positively on this particular feature. And we have a choice. We can basically change the feature or we can improve the feature by doing X, Y, Z. What, what do you think we should do? And turn it into a choice and move it to the future. Um, I don't know if that answers it. If there's a follow-up, you can follow up with that. Uh, Pavan uh, Govinda uh, asks, so how does a product manager balance between empathy and tricking someone? People don't want to see you as a manipulator. That's true. Empathy is not sympathy. Sympathy is when you basically perceived as being uh, a manipulator, right? Uh, you're sympathetic, you're you know, you're giving people flowers and, you know, acting all pretty and stuff, and people can see through that. Empathy is much, much deeper than sympathy. And the way you do that is going back to that um, you really, really have to evaluate every conversation you have with someone. The best way to me measure that is if you, you know, go into a big cocktail party or a party or where you're going to meet a lot of people, and I dare you to spend the entire party meeting people, strangers that you don't know, and asking them questions about them, how they are, and how they're doing. Never talk about yourself. And then at some point, someone's going to turn around and say, how about you? We didn't ask any questions about who you are. What, what do you do? That's an indicator that you're, you weren't just sympathizing with people, you're empathetic towards them. Same goes with your, with your colleagues. Just make sure that you take the time to hear them out, ask a lot of questions and never talk about yourself. The more hidden you are about yourself, the better it is. And then, then if you want to move on to the data, say, I'll go analyze some data and I'll come back to you. And that's how you, you, you stop being a manipulator. But yeah, ultimately, Empathy, using empathy as a product manager is to manipulate, but you, you can't, uh, you know, you're ultimately, if you're framing it for the collective goal of the organization, you're not a manipulator. You're just trying to make sure that people don't make selfish decisions. And if they're able to understand that, you know, selfish choice versus choice that aligns with the company values or company objectives, uh, going with the choice of company objectives is the right one. You're not a manipulator. You're just trying to tell someone, hey, wake up, wake up. You need to align yourself with the company goals, not your personal objectives. So that, so you're no longer perceived as a manipulator if you do that. 
Amit uh, says, how product managers align leadership with clients' requirements, expectations? Uh, can you elaborate on that? How do product managers align leadership with clients' requirements, expectations? Well, um, I mean, the best way, Amit, I can put that is if clients have requirements and expectations, and the company leadership has put objectives and key results that are not aligned with the requirements and expectations of clients, then I think it's important for you to talk to the CEO and to the leadership team to outline the fact that their requirements or their objectives are not aligned with clients, right? And how do you go about that? Well, that goes back into that empathetic conversation. You have to ask the leadership team what they think about their objectives and if they feel that it's aligned with client requirement expectations, ask why they feel that their objectives are aligned with, client, with clients' requirements expectations. Repeat what they say and go back and say, okay, I'll get back to you with some data. And that data is going to prove to you that the rec you're, they're not aligned with rec requirement expectations. And if the data shows otherwise, then you ask them, well, we have a choice. We either change our company objectives to align with the client's requirements and expectations, or we basically uh, shortchange the process and basically don't listen to clients and we become a company that doesn't listen to our customers. Which one will it be? You offer the choice. Either way, we need to move this company forward and the best way to move forward is to align ourselves with client's requirements and expectations. And then if leadership doesn't um, choose the option and they go with the selfish options, then you have to ask yourself as, as a product manager if you're in the right company. It's a big one there. Okay, is there more questions? Uh, I think more are coming. Oh yeah, they're scrolling. Okay, um, Pradeep Kumar says, in big organizations, there are multiple departments and multiple product management features which should be prioritized. How to ensure that during prioritization or conversations, whether that feature is suitable for the rest of other departments or for overall company. How to handle this as a PM? Yeah, this is a very good question. As a product manager, I basically have uh, weekly meetings uh, with marketing, with, uh, in a B2B environment, with sales, marketing, uh, and, um, and the engineering team. Those are weekly one-hour meetings. Uh, then I have meetings with other departments that are um, matrix with my organization. And I have meetings with the CFO and other executives. And once a month, I try to meet with the CEO. Um, if you establish those meetings in your schedule on a regular basis, same time, same place, and other people understand that the, the purpose of the meeting is just for them to provide you, for you to listen, and for them to provide you with their constraints and their situation. And if people feel confident that those meetings are just a place not to be told what to do, but just to basically you know, express uh, some of the constraints that they deal with, then you've created a harmonious environment where people's constraints are being heard and you're able to respond to them by influencing them somehow or whatever. But what really helps is by doing this regularly on a weekly, monthly, and uh, a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis with regular intervals, you're able to make sure that you become that intersection of everyone's concerns and you're able to really frame the conversations, offer choices, and uh, allow the company to make the right decision. Uh, it's, it, if you don't have these types of meetings set up, I urge you to go and set one, them up because you know, it's very, very hard as a product manager to hear everyone's take on things if you know, there, there, there aren't any uh, places or uh, an environment or an arena for people to basically voice their concerns to you. Uh, swap. Swapnil Ran says, can we make drive the people to invoke problem solving curiosity in them to develop a good product design through the process of empathy? Because then even if all the teams are in sync, yet they may be lacking sufficient curiosity. So I guess your question is about, can we get them to become curious? Um, I mean, I'm just gonna take the concept of a, of a, of a physician uh, asking you empathetically, you know, what your life is and how often do you exercise and how many kids you have and how hard is work, you know, that's all about empathetic empathy, but at some point you're going to have to use data. Uh, so they ask you to go and get an x-ray and a blood test. And I think this comes back down to that. It's if you want people to be curious, you know, do the empathetic parts in meetings and then ask, go and ask for data, ask your data scientist to give you all the zeros and ones that you need. 
and then bring people back into the room and say, this is what the numbers are saying. What should we do about it? And you'll notice that people then are going to ask a lot of questions and be curious. Uh, think about how you would react if a doctor told you, here's your test results from your blood test. Your cholesterol is 60 over 80 and it should be in the 70 range. Your blood pressure is 90 over 120 and it should be in this. 60 range. What should we do? Uh, you know, in theory, you'd be curious as a person say, doctor, what are my options here? Can I, should I take a pill? Does exercise help me? Should I eat better? In that case, you know, the, the, that physician doctor has turned you into a problem solver because suddenly you realize that the numbers are not where they should be and you're seeking answers. And instead of him telling you what to do, you know, you're the one asking him what you should do. So suddenly the doctor is in a position to influence you. Um, Pradeep Kumar says, how to ensure that data is correct during initial phase of new product launch? Just to elaborate, you are changing behavior via a new business model, then how data is good to analyze as people take time to change habits. Yeah, yeah I've seen this a lot. Um, a lot of people will tell you there's a lot of bias in the number. Sample size is too small. A lot of people will question whether or not you the right approach to collect the data. Uh, there's, you know, there's so many factors in that. Uh, just, I think as a, you know, if you have a data scientist in your team, you need to work with them as close as possible. Um, I think there's always going to be bias in the numbers. I think you need to be open to that and let people know that, you know, we're not going to look into the numbers as much as uh, this is not, this is not the, you know, like oh, I once had this situation where uh, we were looking at a, a product, it's a product used internationally. And I was basically saying like, I don't understand why people in the UK are working on the product between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. I find that's like ridiculous that people have to wake up in the middle of the night to use the product. And ultimately I didn't factor in the, the fact that they were time zones. So, you know, we can all make mistakes. Data needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, I think that it's easier to be open with everyone and say what, why and how do you think this data is wrong rather than uh, take it for granted. Uh, I think the worst thing we can do as product managers is to uh, take data as being the, the source of truth. Uh, oftentimes, just like a doctor would do, would say, well, let's go do another blood test with another uh, hospital because it, some, oftentimes two test results won't be the same, right? So um, you just ask people like how much do they trust the data and if they don't trust the data and they don't think it's valid, then you heard them. We have a choice. We can go in and make another uh, pass and get more data and remove bias and clean it up or we can make a decision based on this data. But either way, we need to make a decision. And, and you know, you offered them a choice. You said, Option A, go and do more tests. Option B, make a decision using this data. Either way, we need to make a decision. So, you know, we either lose time, make more tests, or we basically use incomplete data or biased data to make a decision. Ultimately, we need to make a decision. And usually that basically leads people to, to realize that maybe they're being too arrogant or too, uh, too analytical about the data. And oftentimes it's irrelevant because you know, decisions need to be made, business needs to move forward. Um, okay, um, anonymous attendee. A PM is very empathetic and compassionate towards the team and teams such as QA, SM, dev folks listen to the PM and trust in his, her stories, planning views and roadmaps. However, a few members of the leadership, especially in big organizations, take this as a threat of losing their own control of the people. How should a PM tackle this situation? You know, to be honest, I, I think that's an interesting question because uh, uh, it's, it, it, if you're, you need to be empathetic with the top leadership as well, you know, and you need to give credit to the, to the people underneath uh, who are basically working like QA and the dev folks and et cetera. I think the reality is that you can't tackle the situation. You need to be as empathetic with, uh, with the top leadership as you are with the rest of the team. But it's normal for the QA team and the dev folks and et cetera to in some ways uh, perceive you as a figure of authority, even though you're not. Um, but there is now none, none of that when you're dealing with leadership, which means that you have to be double as much empathetic. I think that if members of the leadership are uh, seeing you as a threat because you have more influence than they do, even though you don't have a title that says, 
uh, C-suite member or et cetera, um, then you know uh, you take you take that as a positive. Uh, there's one organization I work with, Watch Mojo, where I'm not part of the C-suite. I am. I've been told I'm the most influential person in that organization, but I refuse to go to leadership meetings. Uh, and I refuse to go to leadership meetings because I think that being in an environment full of C-suite people uh, telling uh, and telling him what to do in that meeting is the wrong environment for me as a PM, and I'm perceived as a threat. So what I do is I exclude myself from those meetings, telling him I'm too busy, and then I go and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with those leadership people uh, just to make sure that I'm empathetic towards them. So, so basically the, the answer to that question is if you are put on a pedestal as a PM and that's perceived, then you are perceived as a threat by leadership, then do not go on that pedestal. Try as much as possible to stay humble, take the smallest chair in the room and sit in the smallest chair and pretend that you are, have no influence on anyone. So it's, uh, it's, uh, if you can refuse being part of leadership meetings, you will, you will suddenly uh, get a lot more influence. Uh, Pradeep says, a recent, I recently have design thinking workshops and it's more on looking thin data, how to align leadership teams on thin data. I don't know what you mean by thin data. If you can type an, another thing on that, I, I, would, I would love to. I'm going to move yeah. to the next. Hi, uh, Paul, so I was just, uh, uh, just to help you out, I was just looking into thin data. So it's more like uh, data without connecting it to the human experience, just numbers, just a bunch of numbers what this big data has finally turned out to be. So that's what they're calling as thin data. Meaning mm. I don't have any connection to uh, the external attributes. I just have a bunch of numbers and they disconnected yeah. from the whole uh, human aspect and how, what reason led to those numbers. Yeah. Such kind of disconnected figures is uh, what they're kind of trying to uh, bring forward. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Have a good evening. Thanks everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks guys.